we're going to start our treatment of the H2 at H2 plus system uh, by again constructing our wave function in such a way that we're creating a linear combination of atomic orbitals. So in other words, this was the uh, thing that we wrote down earlier for this. And uh, these represent atomic orbitals on each of the atoms A and B. And this is just a linear combination of those two. Now, I could have different coefficients in front of these. But uh, if we have two atoms coming together that are essentially the, the same uh, type of atom, then those, uh, you know, those coefficients should end up being uh, exactly the same. Now, I'm going to use uh, the special Dirac notation for this, and, and I hope you'll uh, understand that the reason I'm doing this is because it makes a lot of these equations look simpler and allows us to focus on what's important in them. So in other words, I'm going to be using this to represent phi sub a, which is an atomic orbital on a, and this to represent phi b, which is the same thing on b. All right, so when we write these things down, um, we're going to be interested in uh, solving for the expectation, uh, expectation value of the energy of this linear combination state, this LCAO state. All right, so how do we do that? Well, this is just the same as the way we've been calculating expectation values for lots of other systems. So in other words, if I want to uh, determine, for example, what is the energy of one of these states. And again, I, I'm going to beg your indulgence. I'm going to continue to use both of these so that I can get both states at one time with the same equation. All right, all this means is that if I choose the upper index here, I've got to choose the upper index here, and so forth. So E plus or minus is going to be this expectation value of the wave function plus or minus on the Hamiltonian divided by the overlap of this wave function with itself, or the uh, square, uh, square product of it. All right, we're assuming that this is not necessarily normalized. And that actually is a reasonably good assumption because we're, we're picking this out of two orbitals that are on different atoms. So in fact, what we need to do is evaluate this quantity in order to find out sort of what the normalization uh, the condition might be. So let's get started with that. What we're going to do is first evaluate this part, and then in a different video we'll go through the evaluation of this part. And it's worth doing these separately just because they, uh, they have uh, uh, some good meaning that we can derive from each of them. All right, so when I calculate plus or minus uh, the overlap of it with itself, uh, we're going to end up with a uh, quantity to evaluate that looks something like this. All right, now once again, I'll note that these phi A and phi B are, are left in here to be generalized, but for the most part, we're going to come back for H2 plus and consider these to be 1s orbitals. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make contact with that other notation in just a moment. So when I write something like this out, I need to expand it. I'm going to end up with one term that combines these two uh, wave functions. All right, so this is just the overlap of the A orbital with itself on atom A. Then we'll have um, A overlapping with this, but it's got a plus or minus sign, so I'll have plus or minus A with that. Then I'll have plus or minus a B with A. And now I've got two plus or minuses. Well, let me just say, if I have plus or minus of plus or minus one, Plus goes with plus, so I get plus 1. And minus goes with minus, well, that cancels out, and that gives me plus 1. So when I have two plus or minuses like this, I'm always going to get a plus. So this last term is going to be plus phi b phi b. Okay, well, some things to note about this. We're assuming these wave functions, these atomic orbitals, are normalized. So I can substitute 1 in for that, and we can substitute 1 in for that. 
Um, we're also, for the most part, dealing with wave functions written as real functions. Uh, it doesn't matter so much, but uh, what that means is that this quantity and this quantity really are the same number. They, at, at worst, they would be complex conjugates of one another, and by adding them together, we would get... Um, you know, we would get the real part of that uh, complex number. By subtracting them, we'd get the uh, imaginary part. But I'm going to treat them as uh, a real quantity, and I'm going to designate this quantity to be a quantity s. So let me write out what s is. Okay, so s is this overlap between these two orbitals on different atoms that are separated by some distance r. All right, the way we would write this out is we would write this as essentially be a star VB d tau. All right, so it is just the integral of these two functions with one another. Because they're on different atoms, generally speaking, they are not orthogonal to one another. They could be, I'll say, uh, there is a possibility of that, but most of the time they will not be orthogonal to one another. All right, so um, where does this get us? Well, uh, as we work this through, we'll find that psi plus or minus uh, with psi plus or minus is going to give us 2 plus or minus 2s. Or I can factor the 2 out and just say this is 1 plus or minus s. So this, in fact, is the thing that will go in the denominator of our expectation value for the energy. Um, and um, where this s is defined as this particular quantity. This is usually a reasonably easy quantity to uh, compute. Um, the, you know, the functional forms of these wave functions are such that uh, this is something that we can often get a, a good computation for. Now, um, if I wanted to normalize psi plus or minus, this is also what we would need in order to normalize it. We would divide by the square root of this because, remember, we have two factors here. So, in other words, a normalized version of psi plus or minus might look like this. And this is a, an equation, something like this, you will see sometimes in, in textbooks de denoting this. All right, now let's get an idea of what S might look like. Um, first of all, S is going to vary as a function of the distance between the two atoms. So that distance is R. So in, that, in fact, we have, in effect, a function that is a function of R. How does that function behave? Well, let's consider the limits. Okay, when R is equal to zero, what does that mean? That means the two atoms are basically on top of one another. So that means that phi A and phi B are basically going to have the same origin. If they're the same orbital, then we would expect that uh, they're normalized, that s would go to 1. So we should see for two uh, of the same orbital on different atoms overlapping that uh, this integral is going to go to 1 as the two come together. What about as r goes to infinity? Well, in this case, these two atomic orbitals are going to be infinitely far apart. Now, normally for atomic orbitals, they go to 0 as they go to large r. So if we have two functions that are effectively zero in the only place where they overlap, then this means that this overlap integral is, oops, not going to infinity. It's going to zero as r goes to infinity. All right. Now, I've already uh, basically said what this is. This s is something that we know as the overlap integral because it measures the degree of overlap between two functions. All right, now it turns out if I use uh, the hydrogen atom example so that I have phi A is equal to a 1s orbital, almost like 1sA, and phi B is 1sB, it turns out we can get an exact uh, expression for S as a function of R, and it looks like this. It's e to the minus R times the quantity 1 plus R plus one-third r squared. Uh, and uh, this is something that's even worked out in some textbooks. So if we were to draw a picture of what this function looks like, and I'll try to sketch it here as best I can, 
Okay, so this is S of R that we're graphing along the vertical axis, and this is R. It comes up here, and it gently decays down to zero, where this is, in fact, one. And we could determine that by plugging zero in for R. These two terms would disappear. E to the zero is one, so I would just get one. And this decays gently. Uh, at roughly the point where it is at one half um, its magnitude. This is roughly, for the hydrogen atom, roughly two bore, bore, um, bore radii. All right, so we can see that, in fact, as S, as R goes to infinity, S indeed is going to zero, and of course it has the right limit up here. So this is behaving exactly uh, the way we would expect it to behave for two hydrogen atoms coming together.